we have in studio at the present time Dr. Tripp from the Tripp Family Medicine, and he's going to talk to us about uh, um, little things of ear, nose, and throat, coughs, <coughs> sniffles, <Yeah. laughs> all of that stuff that goes on this time of the year. So welcome, doctor. Yeah. How, do, how do we get that under control? I'm happy to hang out in this room with you two. That sounds really good. <laughs> Hey, uh, what, what we wanted to title today's talk was uh, Ear, Nose, and Throat, It's All in Your Head. <laughs> Literally, oh, right? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> so we, uh, you know, there's a lot of fun things as a doctor. I can play on words like that, but that is one that I've used from time to time. Somebody with a sinus infection or, uh, you know, just troubles that they feel like they got the, the head cold as I can, uh, once taking care of them, I can tease them a little bit about, you know, it's all in your head. So we're going to talk about different op. Uh, disease states or symptoms that really do uh, originate in your head, whether it's your ears or your sinuses or your throat. And uh, some of these things will be kind of lighthearted or uh, not too serious. Um, and others will be kind of moderate and others will be de uh, life-threatening, so very serious things. And we'd invite callers that have questions. Um, I'm going to throw out a bunch of stuff. Can I just kind of maybe give you an opener? Yeah. I went on a <clears throat> trip around the world here in January, and, and I was okay till I got home. About the second day home, I got a terrible cold. Wow. And it seemed to settle in my sinuses and my eyes. They were just completely red and bloodshot, and, and you get that film stuff over your eyes. And you talk about, I should have visited with you You're about, miserable, huh? <laughs> about <laughs> 10 days ago instead of today. Okay. So... How do those things hit us, and, and, and are, what kind of precautions can we take to kind of get past that stuff? Well, and you know, the symptoms you talked about, the eyes, I'll have a lot of people come in and say, you know, I have a little bit of a dry cough, but it's the pressure behind my eyes, the burning sensation, and that all has to do with sinus pressure. But it sounds like you even had a little bit of what's called conjunctivitis, where that film and the red bloodshot eyes, uh, the fact that you're over it tells me, Probably that was viral, but how do you avoid viruses? Well, big news in the, in the media right now is the Zika virus, and I think uh, we might even do a special show on that two Fridays from now as uh, that whole story unfolds. But mm -hmm. a virus in general, um, the things that we can do that are easy and yet sound like common sense are wash your hands before you eat because a lot of the diseases, whether it's a head cold or... Uh, you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea are things that we put in our own darn mouth, and I hate to say it, or even our own nose. So mm. washing your hands <laughs> before you touch your face or, you know, eat is a great one. For uh, upper respiratory and even uh, pneumonia types things, a lot of it is airborne. So we were joking about all the coughing we are doing at the beginning of this show, but that sneezing, coughing puts out into the air... Uh, little droplets, you know, microscopic level that we then inhale, and then that's loaded with virus and it gets a chance to take off. So there are, uh, you know, you want to avoid somebody who's hacking all over the place. In our office, if we notice somebody comes in and they're coughing pretty good, we invite them to wear a mask to protect everybody else, including ourselves. So. Right. Which, you know, masks are real effective for that anyway. They right? are. They're, it's not for keeping stuff out. It's for keeping stuff going out, right? Right. Yeah. It, you know, people will often wear a mask if they have uh, real low immune systems like chemotherapy. That is to protect themselves. But uh, it's really, you know, shall we say inconsiderate to cough and hack on everybody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> traditionally in the U.S., we've been told, you know, cover your mouth. So right. we'd use our hand and then we go ahead and put the hand on the doorknob or shake somebody's hand and right. spread it that way. So what's become more, uh, uh, I'd say more effective is to, especially if you have a long sleeve shirt, is to literally turn your, your head to your elbow as you cough or sneeze and it limits how much of those droplets can go to the rest of the air. So those are a couple of things that we can do to avoid your common cold and, and even the flu. You know, boy, we've had a lot of fun with that. Uh, influenza or the flu is cough, congestion, fever, headache, and body aches. You feel miserable. Mm -hmm. And it's not nausea, vomiting, diarrhea that I grew up thinking that was what the flu is. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, your flu vaccines are still important. We're still in flu season, clear till probably April. And in our office, even in the last week, we've had 
two cases uh, that are what are called influenza B, which is still very common, but the more common is a strain called influenza A. Huh. So if you remember the old uh, swine flu from several years ago yeah. that was all over the U.S. and shutting down schools because everybody was sick, yep. um, that was an influenza A type of uh, flu. So, you know, similar precautions with a common cold as you would the flu. Uh, just the flu is more serious and even life-threatening to those that are older or very young. How come when he says those are older, he, he looks right over at me? <laughs> well, you know, um, if the shoe fits, wear it. Is, yeah. that, is that how that works, doctor? You know, I, I'm I'm the one they're calling the old guy at work, so I got you know I have to be careful with how I respond to that. So it's kind of fun. <clears throat> I tell people I had a birthday recently. I tell them I've turned 27, and most laugh about that but, point. Because so. <laughs> it's yeah. not believable, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. You know. <laughs> okay. uh, I probably have more gray hair than you do, so don't. <laughs> well, let's, yeah. let's go on to some of the fun uh, stuff. We'll tell you know. what. We have a break coming up. Oh, do we? Up. we got right. about 20 seconds, so let's... What would you like to talk about oh, when we come back up? Let's talk about ears when we come back. Ears. Oh, great. Okay. Ear wax to ear aches to ear tumors. We'll have some fun with ear that. Ear tumors. Okay. Dr. Yeah. Tripp is our guest. You'll be with us right after the break. Don't go away. Thank you for staying with us. We're back in studio. We have uh, Dr. Jonathan Tripp from Tripp Family Medicine. His office is located on Fillmore Street across from the post office. His telephone number that you can reach him is 933 4400. Doctor, let's talk a little bit more about It's All in Our Head. Okay. We're having some fun with uh, talking about conditions or symptoms, illnesses we get that relate to our head. And so we'll go to ears now. And, oh, the the most common, I would say, is earwax buildup. Say what? Ear- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Say again. Huh? <laughs> All right. The hearing aids are now uh, in place. Uh-huh. And, uh, <laughs> um Earwax is uh, one that people will just have a sudden loss of hearing, usually on one side. Um, and so they come to the office, and you often know what's going on there, what, why it is that way. But sometimes, you know, really scared that they've lost hearing uh, for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. In the old days where we had a lot of mumps going around, people would lose their hearing with a, an illness, with a fever, and uh, because of vaccinations. We almost don't hear about that ca- cause anymore. Um, but there are loss of hearing over time, especially with, uh, lots of sound damage to the ears. A lot of, uh, people, uh, I'll say even over 40, because I probably first noticed it about that age for myself is, oh, I just told them I'm over 27. Uh-oh. Didn't yeah. I? You let it loose. Get the 27 thing. <laughs> you did it, not us. But a, a ringing in the ears, especially when things are perfectly quiet, there's this high pitched little sound that's one tone. And uh, if you're busy, you forget all about it. If you're not, it can get really annoying, and that's called tin- tinnitus or ringing in the ears. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's a tough one to do anything about. Uh, so protecting your hearing is really important. But the earwax, that's an easy one for us to fix. Uh, if it gets hard, it's really to ta- hard to take out on your own. Uh, in our office, we have some nice little uh, irrigation systems that clear that out pretty easily without hurting you. To that point, a lot of people used to clean their ears out with Q-tips. Yeah. I was told by a doctor, don't do that because it makes it worse. <laughs> Why? Well, the Q-tip is almost the right size to fit the whole canal. And if you have something in there, which earwax, mm-hmm. you're you're using that like a ramrod on an old, you know, uh, cannon. You're pushing right. the stuff right to the back. You're packing it. You're packing it in. And okay. boy, you that's often when they have that sudden loss of hearing. I was using a Q-tip and all of a sudden I couldn't hear and my ear hurt a little bit. Did I, you know, ruin my eardrum? Usually not, but... You that, can, though. Yeah, you can, especially the old bobby pin idea. I love that Bobby one. pin. People will use a bobby pin and stick in their ear and Ooh. try to get out the wax and inevitably uh, come out with a little blood or, you know, pain to the ear. Those are the ones we hear about pretty often. Really? Yeah. Well, I've never even <clears> The ones that don't hurt, that, we but... don't hear about. Okay. So if earwax is an ongoing problem... Uh, give us a better solution. I mean, how, okay. how do we mitigate that? Yeah, some people are really susceptible to earwax buildup and others are not. There are um, earwax softening agents. Uh, two names I know off the top of my head are called Debrox or Ceruminex, but you could go to any grocery store or pharmacy and look for earwax softeners. And you're putting a drop or two in your ear once a day for a week, and usually that is enough to clear things out that the wax has a natural tendency 
to wind its way out, and that's why you often find it at the edge of your ear, is because you have a hair system that, mm. that f- kind of allows it to spiral its way out of the ear. So if it doesn't build up, it's because your ears are uh, doing a good job of getting it out. So okay. a little earwax on the outside doesn't deserve a Q-tip inside. I've been told to uh, water down peroxide. <laughs> um, it is effective, uh, and uh, hydrogen peroxide loosens it up really well and can make you extremely dizzy and give you true vertigo and make really? you sick to your stomach. Okay. I've done it personally. <laughs> okay. And so, you know, it's really effective. It is worth a try, but uh, be prepared that... To go on a trip. If it doesn't right. go well, yeah, you, you might need to come see me anyway. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> some other things we often have, in fact, this might be interest, uh, especially to the moms out there, is uh, earaches, otitis media. You know, treating little kids, especially uh, as a former father, not just a um, you know, physician, is you can't tell really what's wrong in their ears you know, the otoscope that we use to look in the air is kind of a specialized piece of equipment, and that helps a lot in making the diagnosis. But uh, treating those kids with appropriate antibiotics sometimes and not others and having other things like ibuprofen that help with the pain, and a particular one that I like is a numbing eardrop that only lasts for about an hour. But when you get woken up at 1.30 in the morning with a screaming kid that you can't console, mm-hmm. Taking the edge off of that pain is is very nice and important, and you do that and give them a little more ibuprofen, and in about five minutes they're back asleep, and so are you, and so that's a whole better scenario. Mm, makes for an easier night. That makes for a great night. Yeah, that take that's just a little experience on my part as a dad that I learned how to get away with that. Would you like to take a phone call? (laughs) Sure, sure. Good morning. You're on Top Story with Doctor Tripp. Good morning. Uh, My mother had a saying she used to do, and I guess it passed down from generation to generation. And she'd say, never put anything smaller than your elbow in your ear. <laughs> I have heard that frequently from other doctors. Uh, and the truth is, is uh, you will never damage your ear if you make it as big as your elbow. Mm-hmm. You'll, you'll never get in there. So that is, you know, that's the safest. That doesn't mean, you know, you couldn't use a Q-tip now and then to clean out the edge of the ear. You just don't want to go far and deep in, go exploring, because... You can't see, and it hurts. Okay. So There's some other things, too, with the ear that, that pop up, maybe not as common as earwax, but uh, some other concerns that people may should. Sometimes this loss of hearing we're talking about that happens on one side, there's an actual tumor called an acoustic neuroma, and it is something that usually can be surgically removed. Uh, the cure rate is variable, but uh, it is a, it's a little tumor. It's like a cancer, but uh, usually not one that's life-threatening. Uh, things that can get life-threatening are tumors in the rest of the head and neck, so salivary glands or down in your throat, thyroid. Uh, those can actually be life-threatening tumors, and uh, sorry to say, we don't, we don't uh, diagnose cancer a whole lot, but in the last couple of weeks, we seem to have been the cancer magnet that we've really? diagnosed uh, several of the neck and others that really uh, have put a dark cloud over our staff. You know, we're usually kind of the happy-go-lucky office, and right. we still are, but you can tell when everybody's quiet that uh, they're thinking about these patients that we've recently given bad news to, and it's I think it's just because we're looking. It's not, you know, we don't have a preponderance of unusually sick people. It's right. just we, we're looking, and we found quite a few in the last little while, and so the good news is, as a family medicine doc, we know we need help with greater expertise. And so all of these people have been pushed on to, uh, you know, cancer experts. And so we have great hopes for them, but it's still no fun to give somebody bad news. Right. So, But at least they caught it. And yeah. early? Was it an early catch? Well, or at uh, least early? It's a mix. Mix, okay. Yeah, it really oh, is boy. a mix. So <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, but, you know, what you might look at a lump in your throat and say, ah, this is just a lymph node. If you've recently been sick, like Steve was talking about, and he had a larger... Uh, lump in his throat that fits where lymph nodes are, today I would probably say, why don't we give that a couple weeks, see if it goes back down. Mm -hmm. But if he says, you know, I've had this for four or five months and it's just not going back down, I'd be all over checking that one out. So, you know, sometimes they are just an enlarged lymph node, but (laughs) he's checking. Steve's checking his neck right now. (laughs) So, you know, so I don't want to downplay them and nor do I want to scare the listeners to say, oh, every little, you know, bump that you find, you really better check out. Right. 
But if it's a bump that's new and a bump that stays, we should probably take a look at that. So it's the stay part that really bothers you. If it's just new and it, it goes away within, in a relatively short period of time. Within a few weeks, <coughs> a, a lymph node should disappear. But but if it's lingering on for some period of time, it probably needs attention. Absolutely. No, I think that's safe on any part of the body. If you got something new that doesn't disappear pretty quick, we probably ought to Bring look at that. So. I want to ask you about something very appealing. Uh, mucus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Boogers. Uh, <laughs> I had a question asked of me. How do we produce so much, you know, stuff? Right. How, how where does it come from? Where does all that come from? Uh, because the truth is the sinuses, the bigger ones, are right above your teeth. And they're about the size of a golf ball on each side. So really? when you think, well, I got two golf balls worth of stuff. How come I can put, you know, a half a gallon out in a day? Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. Or at least it feels like it. <laughs> More than a cow puts out of an udder, right? There you go. <laughs> the, uh, the answer is your body pulls fluid when it's trying to shed a virus or shed what it considers an attacker. Okay. So your whole bloodstream is at its beck and call, if you will to bring in fluid to try to drain or shed this, you know, get it out of there. And the truth is, is you'll notice when you get a cold that first day or two, mm -hmm. it's just like nonstop faucet a lot of times coming right. out of your nose. And that's your body's response saying, get this the heck out. So we that's want. the drain. Yeah, that's the drain. So it's not just whatever fluid happens to be in the sinuses. It, it, it can pull from your whole body. So, you know, <clears> lots <throat> of that, fluid. That's the collection point to help expel all that stuff. Yeah, from... yeah, it's bringing it to the site of the infection because most of your viruses that you breathe in are in your nose. They're not really in your throat. So why do we get a sore throat? Mm -hmm. It's the drainage going down the back of your throat from your nose irritates those, that mucosal layer, the back of your throat. In fact, people will often come in and say, I have a dry cough. And I look in the back of their throat, there's nothing dry about it. Mm. But that irritation, they'll often explain and say, feels like sandpaper. It in feels the back like of dry. Throat. Right. Yeah, it okay. feels yeah. dry. <clears throat> so here's some fun stuff. How many people have had, uh, you know, a kiddo with uh, something stuck in their ear or up their nose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember doing that to my brother. I threw a corn kernel down his ear. Oh, nice. <laughs> I, I was a lot younger, but yeah, yeah I remember doing wow, that. What a nice guy. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> and did you, did you use a Q-tip on it to really get no, it down No, I didn't. There? My yeah. parents just, uh, got, I think they got a little suction cup or those little suck, um, oh, what are they called? The bulb suction. The bulb, suck, yeah, yeah and, they, uh -huh. and they were able to suck it out. With, awesome. So hopefully it didn't suck his ear out. But. No, that's, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> now, the, uh, when I was just starting medical school, I was coming home for Christmas, and uh, so I'd had one whole semester of med school, and uh, we're flying home, and a five-year-old stuck a straight pretzel <laughs> up, up his nose and broke it off. Oh, oh man. And the stewardess came on the... You know, over uh, the flight attendant, uh, I'm using old language. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're but really the, dating uh, yourself. I am, yeah. Well, that's because I'm so young. That 27 yeah. is long is, past. Yeah, it's slipping, <laughs> isn't it? But anyway, the flight attendant came on the overhead uh, speakers and asked if there's any doctors and, you know, anybody is there that a doctor could help. in the house? And, and I just watched and waited and watched, and nobody responded. And uh, I finally just kind of raised my hand and said, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm a medical student, but, you know what's you know is there something i can help with and then they explained you know, this kiddo's got this pretzel up his nose and uh i think it was my wife that came to the rescue with, oh. <laughs> with, with a pair of tweezers <laughs> and we uh we did get the pretzel out it was pretty impressive and i've never seen i never knew until that time who is a, among the strongest of our community and they are five-year-olds because <laughs> it took about six adults to hold him down just to be able to get this Oh, that's so, a lot of his nose. So I walked away, you know, the doctor hero without any doctor experiences. You know. <laughs> but many, many times since then in the ER or in my office have taken out of the ears or the nose, you know, plastic beads or beans or, <laughs> well, yeah. you know. And, and one of the two of the funnest experiences were both in the ER at different times was a young lady who had a small cockroach crawl in her ear. Oh, oh gosh. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> that should get some attention. That's a way to go trip. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good oh, note to end on. <laughs> and, and the other was, uh, you know, somebody was at like a picnic or something, and something flew in their ear, and it was stuck. And it would move, but it couldn't get out. Oh. And it turned out to be a, a small wasp. 
Oh, oh boy. With the stinger sticking out of the ear rather than in the ear. So he couldn't. He didn't get stung. Oh. I mean, talk about lucky. Oh, you boy. Know? Well, so. I've seen videos on YouTube of spiders crawling out of people's ears. Oh, no, I don't want to get into that. No, yeah. <laughs> well, cockroaches, come on. Yeah, no. No, in fact, the cockroach one was fun because we talked to her over the phone several times before she ever came into the ER, and I suggested... Put, you put some olive oil in your ear, <laughs> you know, make it so it can't breathe, so it'll crawl out. Well, it didn't breathe, but it didn't crawl out. So then she came to the ER and we took it out of the oil and had a dead little cockroach. And sure enough. And it just died in there. Yeah, she didn't know what it was. She just said something's in my ear and it's moving around and making scratchy noises. And I was wondering when she uh, talked to you on the phone, did you hear the cockroach talking to you too? <laughs> nah, she used the other ear. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so anyway, these are some kind of the fun things that uh, through my uh, ER experience or office experience. Oh, okay. That'd be scary. Well, we got about a minute. Um, can anything else you want to wrap up yeah, with? Yeah, let me just tell you about where we're going with uh, uh, the, the next week. We're going to talk. Because it's uh, the week before, uh, the Wednesday before Valentine's Day, Ooh. we're going to talk about love and hormones, and you know, pretend I'm the love doc. We'll oh, have dear. Some fun oh, with that. swell. <laughs> yeah. So next next Wednesday so morning, call, we can get all of our we, answers. We want everybody to call in with all of your love problems, and we'll figure that out. Um, and then uh, Are you going to do it, Doctor Laura style? Um, or not quite that. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> I don't know if I have that expertise. Okay. The. Uh, Two, two weeks from now, we're going to talk, uh, because of all this cancer that we've identified lately, how to be a good support to somebody that's been diagnosed with cancer, okay. because that's a tough one to be helpful and not uh, cause more drama. That's good to know. Dr. Tripp, thank you very much. We Thanks, appreciate Dr. it. Thanks, Dr. Appreciate you being in. A little bit of fun. Dr. Tripp, Tripp Family Medicine, telephone number 933-4400.